So this is it. This is the video where your patience will finally be rewarded. This is the video when we get to do it. We get to prove that polynomials of degree 5 do not have a solution in radicals in general. We found out that what we need to do to solve the mystery of quintic impossible is to prove that there is a fifth order polynomial that realizes our worst case scenarios. Our worst fears have to come true for this quintic. Our worst fear is that we have a quintic which is so stubborn, which to construct its splitting field requires us to extend the rationals by extensions of degree 2, 3, 4, and 5, getting only one root at a time until we finally split the whole thing. In other words, we need to show that our worst fear, that there exists a quintic whose Galois group is the entirety of S5, the symmetric group on five symbols, actually exists out there. And in this video, we're going to do that by proving that there is exactly one such polynomial that we can prove directly exists. It turns out there are a whole bunch of them. But we're going to show it very specifically for one polynomial in this video. So here's our burden of proof. We need to show that while it's true that S5 could be the Galois group of a fifth order polynomial, that in fact it is the Galois group of at least some fifth order polynomial. So let's take a look at the facts currently in evidence. If I have a polynomial with rational coefficients of degree n, then some of those polynomials we suspect will be solvable in radicals, some of them we suspect might not be. And we've shown previously that a polynomial is solvable in radicals if and only if its Galois group is a solvable group. Meanwhile, every polynomial of degree n over the rationals will have a Galois group, which is isomorphic to some subgroup of Sn, the symmetric group on n symbols. We also have some facts from group theory about the structure of solvable groups. Specifically, we know that every subgroup of a solvable group will have to be solvable itself. We also know that any group which is not abelian and simple cannot be solvable. In other words, if a group is simple and it's not abelian, then we know for sure that that group cannot be solvable. We've also convinced ourselves that A5, the alternating group on five symbols, is a simple group. Combined with the fact that A5 is not abelian, that implies that A5 is not a solvable group. But on the other hand, A5, the alternating group on five symbol, is a subgroup of S5. And since every subgroup of a solvable group must be solvable and A5 is not, that implies that S5 is not a solvable group. So what do we need to do in order to prove that there exists a polynomial that's not solvable in radicals? It would suffice to find a polynomial whose Galois group is all of S5. In other words, a polynomial where every permutation of its roots is realized by an automorphism of its splitting field over Q. Because if such a polynomial exists, then that means that its Galois group is not a solvable group. And because this implication on the top is a biconditional, that will imply that that polynomial is not, in fact, solvable in radicals. So we want to show that this happens for S5 being a Galois group. And the easiest way to do that is to seek a polynomial that has degree 5. If I can find a fifth order polynomial whose Galois group is isomorphic to all of S5, then I've done it. And that's what we want to do in this video. But we need to be really specific. Because we know that every Galois group of a quintic is going to be isomorphic to a subgroup of S5, but we don't yet know that there's one that gives us all of S5 until we can show you a specific example, and that's exactly what we're going to do. So first of all, here's a polynomial. I pulled this polynomial out of thin air. There are lots more like it, but we're just going to look at this one in this video. t to the fifth minus 6t plus 3. The claim is that this polynomial's Galois group is isomorphic to all of S5. So let's figure out everything that we can possibly know about this polynomial. First of all, we know that P is irreducible over the rationals because it satisfies Eisenstein's criterion with a prime of 3. Second, we know that it's separable. No two of its roots are equal. All of its roots are distinct. We can tell that using a simple fact from calculus, namely that its derivative is equal to 0 only at places where p is not. In other words, p is not going to have a repeated root because there's going to be no place where it crosses the x-axis that it doesn't cross directly through the x-axis. In other words, we can't get a repeated root unless p and p prime are both 0 at the same place. But p prime is 0 wherever p is not, and vice versa. Therefore, all the roots of this polynomial are distinct. We can use some more facts from calculus to shed some more light on p. 
P has two real critical points that are both non-degenerate. For t equals plus or minus 1.2 to the power 1 fourth, our first derivative is equal to 0, but our second derivative is not 0 at those points. At the positive critical point, the second derivative is positive, and that makes it a local minimum. At the negative critical point, the second derivative is negative, making that point a local maximum. And so what we know is we know what the basic shape of the graph of p as a real valued polynomial will look like. It has to have a local maximum at t equals negative 1.2 to the 1 fourth, and a minimum at t equals positive 1.2 to the 1 fourth. So its graph has to look something like this. But we don't know exactly where vertically this graph is located, so there are two possibilities. It could cross the t-axis here exactly once and have one real root and four non-real roots. Or if we just move this graph down by a couple of inches here, we have another set of possibilities whereby this polynomial has three real roots and two non-real roots. But because this polynomial has exactly two turning points, these are the only possibilities. So we want to figure out which one of these our polynomial falls into. Well, let's just evaluate the value of p at both of these critical points. At its local maximum, the value of p is about 8.02, so it's positive. At its local minimum, the value of p is about negative 2.03, which is negative. In other words, there is a sign change in between its local maximum and its local minimum. Therefore, because this is a continuous function, and we have the intermediate value theorem in calculus, we know that there has to be a root in between that local maximum and that local minimum. Therefore, we've ruled out the case of our polynomial having only one real root. Therefore, this polynomial has three roots that are real and two roots that are not real. So here we have a polynomial which is irreducible, which is separable, which has two real critical points that are both non-degenerate, and by plugging in some numbers, we've discovered that it has exactly two non-real roots. So now let's figure out what we can say about the Galois group of this polynomial. First of all, because this polynomial is irreducible and separable, we know that its Galois group is going to be isomorphic to what's called a transitive subgroup of S5, the symmetric group on five symbols. What else do we know? Well, here's where we get to use this fact about it having exactly two non-real roots. Let's imagine that we built the splitting field for this polynomial. Well, over that splitting field, our polynomial is going to split into linear factors. t minus one root, t minus the other root, t minus the third root, t minus the fourth, t minus the fifth. So it has to split completely in the splitting field. That's what splitting fields do. But if exactly two of these roots are not real, let's say the fourth and the fifth, that makes the other three real roots. And if we take that splitting field and we intersect it with the field of real numbers, we're going to get an intermediate field here. And over that intermediate field, three of the factors will split into linear factors. Those will be the real roots. But then the two non-real roots will be compartmentalized into this irreducible quadratic factor. And that's a degree 2 extension. Therefore, the Galois group of that extension, in other words, sigma over the intersection of sigma with the real field, has to be z mod 2. Because it's a normal extension of degree 2, the Galois group has to have order 2. But then that implies that these two non-real roots have to be related by that non-trivial automorphism, which must be complex conjugation. So in other words, alpha 4 and alpha 5 have to be complex conjugates one of another. The quadratic formula could also have told us that. But the real implication of that is that complex conjugation therefore extends to an automorphism of the splitting field over Q. And we know exactly what algebraic structure complex conjugation is going to have as an element of that automorphism group. Namely, it's going to be an element of the Galois group of order 2. Thinking of it as a subgroup of S5, that means that G is going to have a 2 cycle inside of it. So that's the first thing that we observe by observing that this polynomial has exactly two non-real roots. Because those roots must be complex conjugates one of another, complex conjugation has to be an automorphism of the splitting field over Q, which corresponds to a two cycle. That's what we get from information at the top of our tower. Now let's get some more information out of that observation, but at the bottom of the tower instead. Let's take one of those real roots, let's call it alpha 1, and let's extend by just alpha 1. In other words, let's take the extension of q using this polynomial, t to the fifth minus 6t plus 3, as its minimal polynomial. Well, what can we say about that extension? That extension has to have degree 5. Why? Because this polynomial, p, is a fifth order polynomial, which is irreducible. So if we extend using that as a minimal polynomial, the degree of that extension is 5. 
So according to the Galois correspondence, there's going to be some index 5 subgroup H inside of G. We don't know at this point that H is a normal subgroup of G, so we can't make any conclusions based, for example, on the quotient G mod H. But on the other hand, we know that 5 has to be a factor of the order of the entire group G. Why? Because of the Tower Law. Right? The Tower Law implies that 5 has to be a divisor in the order of the total extension of sigma over Q. But then, because G is the automorphism group of that total extension, and that total extension is normal, the order of G is going to be the same as the degree of that total extension. So if 5 is a divisor of that degree, then 5 must be a divisor of the order of the group G. But Lagrange's theorem has a partial converse in group theory that says, if I have a prime number that divides the order of a group, then there must be an element of that order inside of my group. If 5 divides the order of G, then G has to have an element of order 5, which in the symmetric group corresponds to a 5 cycle. So not only does our automorphism group have to have a 2 cycle in it, it also has to have a 5 cycle in it because there is a quintic intermediate field over Q. So now we know a lot about this Galois group. It has to have a 2 cycle in it, and it has to have a 5 cycle in it, and it has to be a subgroup, a transitive subgroup, of S5. So let's see what that gets us in total. We lose a little bit of generality in assuming that sigma and tau, my 2 cycle and 5 cycle, have this form, 1, 2, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But I hope you'll be convinced that the argument we're about to make would work no matter what the relationship between the 2 cycle and the 5 cycle that we have happens to be, just by a relabeling of the symbols 1 through 5. So if I have this 2 cycle and this 5 cycle, let's see what other elements I must have in my Galois group. We must have the element sigma 1, which is tau, sigma, tau, inverse, because tau and sigma and tau inverse all belong to G. Well, let's see what that is in the symmetric group. Applying tau inverse rotates all of my symbols to the left by one place. Then applying sigma is going to swap the two that are highlighted in red. Then applying tau is going to rotate everything to the right by one slot. And in total, what I've done is I've swapped the symbols 2 and 3 by constructing this element. Therefore, the 2 cycle 2, 3 belongs to my Galois group. Likewise, if instead of t and t inverse, I use t squared and t squared inverse, now all the elements here take two steps to the left. Then we swap the ones that are marked, and then take two steps to the right. And in total, we've swapped 3 and 4. If I use t cubed to conjugate instead of t squared, I take three steps to the left. And then I swap the two that are marked and take three steps to the right. And in total, I've swapped 4 and 5. Finally, doing it with t to the fourth, I take four steps to the left. I swap the ones that are marked and take four steps to the right. And in total, I've swapped 1 and 5. So just by computing these uh, combinations of elements, we've shown that we can actually transpose any two adjacent symbols in G. Therefore, we can show that we can get any possible transposition. For example, 2, 5, we can get by conjugating 1, 5 by 1, 2 on either side. And since 1, 2, and 1, 5 we've shown belong to our group, that must mean that 2, 5 belongs to this group as well. We can also get any 3 cycle. Just convince yourself that these two adjacent transpositions give us 2, 4, 3, for example. We can get any 4 cycle. Because we know we have all the 2 cycles, we can just combine this combination of 2 cycles to get this 4 cycle. And of course, we can show also that we can get any 5 cycle just as a composition of 2 cycles as well. So because we have every adjacent transposition in G, you can convince yourself that we therefore have every single element of the symmetric group in G. So what have we shown? We've shown that this Galois group is in fact all of the symmetric group on five symbols. So we can get any element of S5 just because we have a two cycle and a five cycle. And we have a two cycle and a five cycle because on the one hand, we have exactly two non-real roots, which gives us complex conjugation in our automorphism group. And we have a fifth degree intermediate field, which we've shown implies the existence of an element of order 5 in our Galois group. Therefore, the Galois group of this polynomial being all of S5 means that this polynomial does not have a solvable Galois group. And because it doesn't have a solvable Galois group, P is not solvable in radicals. There is nothing like a QED that has taken about 9 or 10 hours of videos as dense as this one to find. 
hats off to you if you've made it this far. We have just proven, you and I together, that there exists a fifth degree polynomial out there somewhere, specifically that one right there, which is not solvable in radicals because its Galois group, S5, is not a solvable group. And just to recap the logic of the proof, what did we have? First of all, by showing that this polynomial's Galois group is S5, and S5 is not a solvable group, that implies that the Galois group of this polynomial is not solvable, and therefore this polynomial is not solvable in radicals. And if this fifth degree polynomial does not have a solution in radicals, that means that there cannot be a formula in radicals to solve every fifth degree polynomial equation. And that's it. It took us a lot of machinery to get to where we are at this moment. But right now you can see the power of abstract algebra because it took us a lot of understanding of fields to build all the way to the Galois correspondence. And then from there, it still took us a lot of understanding about groups to figure out what exactly property of groups that we needed in order to connect the idea of solvability in radicals with the idea of the structure of the splitting field of a polynomial. But now we've done it. And if we can't solve this particular fifth degree quintic in radicals, that means that there exist polynomials of degree 6, 7, 8, 12, 15, 25 that we can't solve in radicals. Just for example, take any polynomial that has this particular p as one of its factors. Therefore, algebra runs out of steam between degree 4 and degree 5. Every quadratic, cubic, and quartic polynomial, we can find its roots through a simple extraction of radicals. But starting with fifth order and higher, we can't do it. And to me, that's one of the greatest stories ever told in algebra or in mathematics generally.